Yes, I'd like to talk about uh, these. I have two documents that I brought with me because I think uh, documents like this have been um, very useful in the period since they were produced. So the first one is, was the County Watershed Atlas uh, from 2003. And I was totally impressed because it had a lot of, um, you know, advanced 2003 technology showing the layers of um, information for the maps. And to me, I said, well, you know, if this is what we're going to see when we come to a symposium, I'll have to come back to more. But I think we've become more savvy. You know, our websites are, are definitely more attractive. Um, our publications are going to continue to evolve. When we look back at the Contra Costa Watershed Atlas, at the time, that was sort of cutting edge uh, technology and publication work with using um, GIS and mapping. Uh, this was before Google Maps and Google Earth. And uh, now you look back at it and we <laughs> it's it's still something we're proud of, but it looks more like crayons compared to what, what we can produce now. And so uh, we've certainly evolved in, in our ways of communicating and our ways of presenting information. I think technology has made a huge impact in that we can uh, you know, interact with surveys. We can, you know, uh, reach out to people through social media. Um, we can use videos and other types of production that, you know, weren't necessarily as accessible in the earlier years. The use of technology has really improved over time. I remember um, at one symposium, the each creek group was asked to give a 60-second um, summary of the projects, and I remember this long line of people lined up at the microphone and shuffling through, giving their 60-second interview, and then moving on. And then at the last symposium, there was this beautiful video that people submitted uh, with pictures and of their creek and. Um, and I think technology has really uh, helped people be able to take short videos of, and pictures and compile them easily. I remember being amazed in, at the 2003 symposia at how awesome the GIS mapping was and how high quality that was based on the computer horsepower we had at the time. And in 2011, does anyone remember that we were reminded to bring our phones that had texting capabilities? Now, what's next? Virtual reality to look through our watersheds. I look forward to what we have in the future. Next up, we have Matt Growl. Matt is the Chief of Stewardship for the East Bay Regional Park District. And Matt's going to tell us about the largest creek restoration in the history of the Regional Park District, which is impressive considering the size of it. And specifically, it's about the restoration of Upper San Leandro Creek in Robert Sibley Volcanic Park. I can tell he's very ready to get started. He's breathing it on my neck. Matt, thank you very much and welcome. Okay, well thank you for the introduction and just thanks also for just the opportunity to present today. I really appreciate the committee uh, selecting this as a topic and the opportunity to really talk about it. For me, it's really exciting to be here today and be presenting, especially on this project. Um, I attended my first um, watershed symposium in Contra Costa in 2003, and at that time we were working on a plan in Wildcat Creek for a Wildcat Creek watershed restoration plan, and I was doing a habitat assessment of parts of um, lower Wildcat Creek all the way up in, through Tilden Park, and met so many of you here that inspired me at the time. I mean, there were a group from spawners were here, and I got to talk to them at the table about what we were working on, and we had uh, Friends of Five Creeks had presented that day and talked about some things they were working on. We also had Friends of Walnut Creek, and all, all these Friends of Creek groups that were here, and uh, and Friends of Alhambra Creek had a great project happening, and it was really inspiring just to hear about the work that was happening with the community groups at the time. And, um, and after that, I uh, then got a job at the Regional Water Quality Control Board. So then fast forward to the next symposium in 2007, I was here, and some of the projects being talked about were things I'd worked on as a permit, written permits for, and I was hearing about future projects that I knew I'd be working on. Um, to, to help permit and uh, started really learning more about the vision of flood control uh, and, and working with Mitch and Paul Detchens and others. Um, you know, I started permitting some of their early uh, maintenance projects where they really had this vision to do more restoration. And, uh, and that really vision really in, in made me want to go work for an agency that would uh, start implementing and doing restoration projects. And the Park District passed Measure WW, bond measure in 2008, and in that bond measure there was uh, 
$8 million dedicated for urban creek restoration. And knowing that there was the agency was that committed to it really made me want to go work for the, the agency and really work on restoration projects. So now to fast forward here and to be here, it's just uh, talking about this extremely large creek restoration project. And, and it really, it's not about me. I mean, I've been part of this team, but it's really been a team effort. And uh, we wouldn't be doing this project if I mean, some of our Pete Alexander, our fisheries manager, had the initial vision, and then uh, Julie Bondren, a planner, and I really uh, took that vision and started really pushing to do the restoration. Um, and then our board, um, and Anna uh, recognized four of our board members that are here today, and they've just really been champions of this all along the way, and have really been pushing us to, to keep it going and helping us uh, work to acquire the funding to do, to do this project. Um, and then also our general manager, um, Robert Doyle, and our deputy general manager, who you just heard from, Ana Alvarez, have just been really strong advocates of this project. And if they weren't um, you know, pushing us forward, well, we wouldn't be here. But really, every department in the Park District, uh, from public affairs um, and now design and construction, is really in the lead on, on pushing this forward and getting us towards construction. So it's just uh, a great time to be here, and it just makes me reflect on how uh, this event has uh, really evolved over time, and it's just really great to see the scale of projects that are happening now in the county 16 years later. So with that, um, start talking about this project, Upper San Leandro, in Upper San Leandro Creek. So we used to call this area, and um, we've often referred to it as a working name, as the McCosker Creek. And you might have seen an early agenda and it referred to that. And I, I really want to discourage anyone from using that name. Uh, it's a personal preference. The McCosker family uh, was the one that actually uh, put this creek underground years ago and, and created a lot of impacts to the creek. And so I think we're, we're trying to move away from that and we'll talk more about the, how we've named the branches of the creek, but we really wanna um, highlight the importance of this area. Um, and so as you can see here's uh, where the area is up here in Upper San Leandro Creek. Um, this is right off um, Pinehurst Road. And it's um, also, if you know where the Wilder development is here, we're just um, south of that um, as you come through the, um, south of that as you come through the tunnel. And a little, Closer view uh, shows within the park how it relates to Sibley Volcanic Regional Park. Um, here's some of the main staging areas now, and then we here's Pinehurst Road, and uh, and this is where there's right now a small staging area to do, hike on some trails, um, but um, the the whole area has it will need to really be restored to make this whole area function as a park. So um, just some of the history um, on the this project. Um, you know, like I said, the McCosker family uh, had this, operated this ranch for many years, and uh, and they, when they operated as a ranch, they also had a quarrying operation on site. They did some quarrying. Um, they also were contractors, and so they built all kinds of infrastructure throughout the park, and I mean throughout the property, and uh, and put the creek underground through the bottom of the valley, and then cr and created some benches and terraces in some area. And this photo is, is actually one of the terraces that was created. Um, before, and they, they basically, there was a hill right where we're looking at that uh, was cut down, and a lot of that fill was taken down and placed in the bottom of the valley and filled the stream. And so now when we do actually daylight the creek um, and, and remove the sediment, we're going to place it back in this area, uh, but we're also going to be creating a terrace um, so we can have some other um, uses there, uh, but putting the material back kind of where it came from. Um, but we, the Park District uh, got this property in 2010, and we really first started looking at it, and, and really as soon as we went out and did our first initial site visits uh, with the stewardship department, we, we saw the opportunity for this restoration, uh, but we were a little taken aback by the scale, and, and our fisheries manager, Pete Alexander, said to me, so hopefully you'll get to finish this by the end of your career. And so, uh, you know, it's really exciting to be here today and be on the precipice of really uh, going out and, and awarding a contract to, to start building this project. So uh, it's happened really quickly, but some other things um, on the property really um, forced us to move a little bit faster than we wanted to. So this photo here uh, and these maps kind of show some of the features that were there. I'm gonna have to interpret this a little bit for you. Um, it's hard to read this legend down here, and I think some of you are getting blocked by me um, and the podium. Um, so right here, these, these pockets of orange are really the only um, riparian habitat that exists right now in this lower reach. Um, these are some of the other habitat types that are present, but the stream, this blue line right now does not exist. All that's in a pipe, and there's only these pockets of riparian habitat. And uh, we initially started on this project, and we were going to do the main stem and then deal with this tributary that comes down here and this other tributary in a later phase. And two years ago, um, after, or about three years ago now, after some, some big rains, all those, those streams started um, unraveling and also uh, the culvert started deteriorating, and we realized that we had to do the whole project at once. We couldn't wait. We couldn't do it in phases because if we did the lower part of the project and the lower reaches uh, really quickly, we would, um, the, these other failing segments would then um, it, impact the restoration, that sediment would come down and fill those lower areas. So we had to expand the project um, really 
you know, and often we get concerned with scope creep and things like that, but this is really uh, to make the restoration really as meaningful and, and uh, long lasting as we possibly could. So the other uh, picture over here starts to show what really prompted this to move faster is that there were all these sinkholes started forming uh, around uh, the property. Um, and we started having all these areas where the culverts were failing. And um, as you can see here, some of these culverts and things, they, they were just put together in weird ways. I mean, this isn't the best way, but there were some we had where they'd have a 56 inch culvert and then another 48 inch culvert or so smaller put inside it without any collaring and, uh, and then light and, and soil put on top of it. Or they had just um, strange things to collar the culverts together and they've, all those things started deteriorating, culverts started rotting out. And so before we could open it up to the public, we wanted to open some of these areas where there are existing roads to the public. And before we could do that, we um, had to start putting extensive fencing and things to keep people out of here and all this signage. And, uh, and this, all this, these sinkholes and all these things that started forming, we really realized we had to accelerate this creek restoration and really protect this area, but then also be able to open it up to the public and to be able to have uh, a, a, a good site there, we really needed to do something about all these, um, the deterioration that was starting to happen. So, um, so we started working on this, and we, we started really coming up with the designs. And so now what we're looking at is um, we're going to be daylighting over 3,000 linear feet of stream channel. And so what, as far as I know, this is the largest daylighting project in, in the history of the Bay Area. Um, it's basically, and we will store over 3,200 linear feet. There's some other segments of channel that are open that I, I pointed in that early figure. Um, but it's also going to create four acres of riparian habitat on the site, which is just a, a truly amazing. Um, and there's great habitat in the upper parts of the watershed for whip snake, and even in the upper parts of the stream, there's just a, a great uh, riparian canopy of a lot, a lot of madrones, um, also a lot of alders and, and, and oaks, and other things. And so it's just it's, there's good habitat above the property, and then there's also good habitat below this property in, in San Leandro Creek. So right now there are rainbow trout that migrate from Upper San Leandro Reservoir, and they get stuck at the culvert at the bottom of this property. And so they can't, and they, they even come onto the property a little bit, and there's a, but now there's a, a, a hole that they can get into, it's a, a pool. And then there's about a 15 foot elevational <laughs> um, gap between the, where that pool is and the property. So what we will be doing with this is reestablishing that connection from that culvert um, into the rest of the property, and then restoring all the riparian vegetation in the area. So um, this figure kind of show, shows more about what we'll be doing. Um, the challenge with this, though, is that, um, or the, this figure, one thing I want to show that we, we are planning to have a, a group camp on the site, but I just want to point out that these areas, these are just concepts right now to make sure we have enough uh, space um, for them in the future, but we haven't really designed, the, this is just a concept. Really what we've been designing is the stream channel here, tributary coming down, and then the main stem of the creek and this other tributary above here. And so we've um, been working on the design for that restoration, and that's what we're going to be working on right now. After we finish the restoration, then we'll be moving forward with some of the other improvements um, several years from now. Uh, but here's just a schematic of what we're looking at. Basically, there's going to be, uh, throughout most of the uh, creek, it's going to be a boulder uh, step pool system. Um, but then um, as, as we get into some of the uh, steeper reaches, it's really going to be true boulder cascades. And so we're not going to have enough uh, space for step pools, and it's a really steep reach. So we really have to have um, full, and there'll be these boulder cascades um, as part of it. But we'll be constructing the creek with these um, weir structures and logs and, and natural rock um, that's... Um, Native, native to the area, and um, and then be um, you know reestablishing the appropriate habitat conditions for rainbow trout um, throughout the stream, and so um, you know I, I mentioned some of the statistics earlier, but this this figure shows it a little bit more um, about some of the areas that will be restored. I mean this this area we showed this figure does not show this tributary that will come up through this area, but this whole area has good habitat for um, Alameda whip snake we know around the area. So this riparian habitat is really going to create a lot better habitat for those Alameda whip snake to come in and forage in the riparian zone. Um, same thing with, um, there. we don't have uh, red-legged frogs present right at this site right now because of the deteriorated condition, but we know in some of our parks and some areas right around here in, in Sibley proper and other places there are red-legged frogs, and so we know once we do build this and reestablish it, they will likely recolonize these stream pools um, in the summer. And, uh, and like I already said, we, we know rainbow trout are there, and as soon as we um, restore this, they will be coming onto the property because they're right there present in Upper San Leandro Creek. So there's going to be really a great expansion of habitat for all, for all these species, and, and not to mention the four acres of riparian habitat that will really support so many riparian birds and, and other migratory birds. So the project timeline, uh, we're, we're planning to be construction, we're planning to be start construction this year in the spring. Uh, we're planning to go out to bid 
um, in January, uh, and, and we 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 did try this before, but the bids were came back really expensive last year. So we've tried to refine our uh, our, our designs, and we've also and gotten some additional monies uh, that make us think that we're highly likely we will be able to uh, award the contract and start construction. It's going to be a two year because of the scale of the project and the work windows. It will be a two year project. Um, we're going to have to build it over two years. Um, but we really hope that um, you know, in, in four years from now, we, this is going to be one of our field trip sites, and we'll be able to go out and see the restored uh, creek and, and see what everything that's happening there. You know, the park, di park district really has a long-term vision with this site, though, to become a real education center to educate people on creek restoration and to have school groups and other community groups be able to come out and see the evolution uh, and the reestablishment of this riparian site. So, um, really hope to engage uh, all of you in the audience and um, other groups in the area to really help educate um, other generations and help uh, create um, these really con connections to these restoration projects. Okay, so one thing I have to acknowledge is uh, Assembly Member Rebecca bauer Kahan. So I talked about some of our funding challenges. Um, she heard about this project and got really um, excited about it and was able to go to the state legislature this summer and got us about $4 million uh, in the state legislature to help finish this project. So it was extremely exciting. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah. This was the single largest uh, amount we've ever gotten uh, from the legislature for a restoration project. So it's a very exciting um, and very um, important to us to be able to do this. But we, we wouldn't also, we have many other funders that are a part of this. We've got a, a River Parkways grant. We also got a State Coastal Conservancy uh, Prop 1 grant. Uh, we also got money from Urban Rivers. We have money from the EPA. And, um, and then we also have some other grants pending from the Wildlife Conservation Board and CDFW. And then to top it all off, we'll be using our bond measure money to, uh, to finish that, uh, the piece uh, and be able to put the full project uh, picture together. But it really wouldn't be ha possible to be moving forward this fast without that influx of money from the state in, in the last budget process. Okay, so yeah, and then here's just uh, highlight some of the more uh, members. I mean, I guess the other part of this is one thing we've done to, to move this forward is uh, Caltrans um, had a violation um, on, on Highway 84, um, and it did some things illegally there, and, and they had a violation they had to crack with the water board. And, um, and that's some piece I probably should have turned it a little bit earlier, because we were looking to something to get this design going, and they needed 1,000 linear feet of daylighting, and they didn't have anywhere to find that. It's really hard to find 1,000 linear feet to daylight a creek. And so that opportunity and the, the pushing of the water board to have them fund this project was really what started it all. And so they, they gave us initially $2.6 million to start with the design and to pay for the, the lower reaches of the creek. The, the rest of the stuff we've, we've you know, we've been getting outside funds to do, but that was another uh, important source to think about at times when uh, these violations do happen. We certainly wouldn't want to be doing this project to enable that type of development, but since a, a, a bad thing has already happened, um, it's an important way to correct that situation. Okay, oh, so yeah, um, I have time for questions and that's the end, so thank you very much. <laughs> Since you do not have your phone, I'm going to read some of the questions that we have on our app. And anyone else that has one in the audience. But to start, uh, there's a question, why did the park district decide to exclude dogs from this area? Well, um, well I, I think originally we, we decided to exclude dogs um, because of some concerns uh, about the area. Um, and we've had issues in many of our other areas with um, dogs that are un- um, maintained, I guess, we I mean, have in voice control, but in, in Wildcat Creek and Redwood Creek, we've had significant uh, damage to our rainbow trout habitat from dogs going into the creek um, repeatedly and creating areas of erosion and uh, destabilizing egg masses during spawning times. And so we've, we've tried to deal with it in those areas with education and signage and, and getting people to keep their dogs on leash, but it really just is, isn't effective often. Uh, people just keep going in over time, over and over again. So I think when we had a chance to establish this area as a new use, we wanted to make sure in the creek section of the area that the dogs would not be allowed. Dogs are allowed on leash on the trails in the other parts of the park and in the upper watershed. They're just not allowed, they will not be allowed in the riparian zone in that lower part of the creek. Very well said. A couple more for you. Uh, how will you divert stream flow during construction? 
Yeah, yeah, we'll have just a dewatering system we'll be put in during construction. There, there is pretty good base flow throughout the year, so we will need to have a dewatering system that will dewater the creek in the upper reaches and then um, transport that water down to, to San Leandro Creek around the restoration. Uh, but we will be doing it in phases. So the first phase will be done, and then we'll reestablish the creek in the, in the, in, in, over the winter. And then the next season, we'll start. Um, we'll do a dewatering during the construction season again. Got time for one more? Sure. Um, oh, they're coming in now. I'm gonna. I'm gonna pick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how will you? Oh, we just asked that one. How about? Uh, does the project provide water quality benefits to Upper San Leandro Reservoir? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, the, right now, if you saw those failing culverts and all the things that are happening with the failing infrastructure, there is sediment leaving the property and going down towards Upper San Leandro Reservoir. So this will, one, will stabilize that and create a stable channel so we won't have excess sediment from previous development going down into the, uh, the, the San Leandro Creek. But um, also, it will help uh, retain water in certain times of the year and also just expand the habitat um, from the reservoir up to through this area. OK. I'm going to let Matt off the hook. I know there's other questions, but maybe you can catch him uh, before he leaves. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Great presentation. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I just want to say thanks. And I will be around all day and uh, towards the end of the day. So I really look forward to talking to more people about this project. Super passionate and excited about it. And just would be happy to talk more about it all day. So thanks. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, for asking the questions uh, via the app. I know there was a few we didn't get to, um, but I'm going to move it along. And something special for you now, we've got a double feature. We have Ann Bremer and Sarah Puckett. Ann and Sarah have both participated in a number of restoration projects throughout the county. Ann works as a pro program manager for the Watershed Project, and Sarah is a consultant with American Rivers. And they're gonna look at two different projects, Marsh Creek in East County and Ream Creek in West County. And they're gonna compare how a project starts and gains momentum. And this is kind of interesting because, spoiler alert, they're very different. So ladies, please come up. Please welcome Ann Bremer and Sarah Puckett. These come off if you want to take them okay. off, whatever's easiest for you. All right. Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here. The Contra Costa Watershed um, Symposium is just such a great event, and thank you to Elisa for organizing it all. Um, my name is Sarah Puckett, a consultant with American Rivers, and this is Ann Bremer with the Watershed Project. And I'm going to start today with Marsh Creek. So why Marsh Creek and where is Marsh Creek? Um, Marsh Creek flows off the this is Mount Diablo right here, flows off the eastern slope of Mount Diablo through the rapidly growing communities of Antioch, Brentwood, and Oakley, and out to the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, which is the water supply for two-thirds of California. So uh, it's the second largest watershed in the county. And um, at the, the Three Creeks Project, which we'll be talking about today, is right in the heart of Brentwood. And then at the mouth of Marsh Creek is the Dutch Slough Wetland Restoration Project. And that's, there we go. All right. Uh, it's an 1,100 acre tidal marsh uh, restoration project at the mouth of the creek. And um, uh, the ground start was broken in 2018. And the, the levee that, that connects Marsh Creek and the Dutch Slough Project is going to be breached in 2021, which is very exciting. And the goal of this project is to provide much needed habitat for salmon and other fish and wildlife in the, in the Delta. So that's what we got started on in the watershed. And, and then moving upstream, we didn't know too much about Marsh Creek. This was back in uh, the early 2002. And so we partnered with the City of Brentwood Park and Recreation Department to do a survey of, of 2,000 people that lived within a quarter of a mile of Marsh, Sand, and Deer Creek. And we asked them, what do you like about the creek? What do you think about Marsh Creek? Do you even know that Marsh Creek is a creek? And, um, and what do you think are the biggest problems facing the creek? And the residents responded that trash and no shade were the two biggest problems facing the creek. <laughs> so if you are familiar with Marsh Creek, 
Uh, th there's a great uh, East Bay Regional Park District operates the Marsh Creek Regional Trail that um, goes all the way from the southern end of Brentwood out to the Delta. Hopefully we'll connect someday soon to, to Mount Diablo. And, um, and there's just, it's very hot in the summer out there and no shade. And so this really kicked off a 20 year effort with multiple partners to figure out how and where are we gonna plant trees along Marsh Creek to sh create a shady natural creek corridor. And all of our projects that we've uh, been working out there for the last 20 years have really all had four main goals. One, to restore riparian and floodplain habitat two, increase recreational opportunities, three, improve water quality in the creek and in the delta, and then four, to maintain or improve flood protection. So despite the lack of trees, uh, Marsh Creek is home to a surprisingly um, diverse and abundant amount of fish and wildlife species. Every time I go out to the creek, I was there yesterday, there was muskrats swimming around, river otters, Swainson's hawk, um, burrowing owls, herons, and, um, and so lots of, of different fish and wildlife species. And however, also um, over the last 15 years, there's been 10 documented fish kills at the, at the uh, lower portion of Marsh Creek where all the fish in Marsh Creek die all at the same time. And so poor water quality has really motivated the community and stakeholders to get involved and take action in Marsh Creek. And it's great to see the 50-year plan being mentioned so much today. So right around the time American Rivers started working in the watershed, the district began to rethink their vision of how to manage the creeks throughout the county. And um, the 50-year plan really opened up the door for creek restoration projects in the county and also in Marsh Creek. Um, oh, and most importantly, the, uh, the Contra Costa County Flood Control District owns the entire Mar uh, Marsh Creek flood control channel through Brentwood and Oakley. So that's why this 50 year plan and really kicked off a great partnership between American Rivers and the district that continues on today. So and two of the main things are to convert the concrete and riprap line flood control channel, which is, um, describes Marsh Creek into a more natural creek system and also to plant trees and, uh, and channels while still maintaining flood protection. So this uh, top diagram is what Marsh Creek looks like, most of, um, most of Marsh Creek looks like today. Um, and due to extensive flooding of mostly farmland back in the 1950s, the Soil Conservation Service removed all the trees and straightened the channel, and it was a very efficient way of getting all the floodwaters out to the delta as fast as possible, but not much riparian habitat. So, and the flood control channel was also designed to hold exactly the 100 year flood flow and nothing else, including no trees. Uh, so how do we plant trees along Marsh Creek? Uh, became the big question. And in order to make room for both trees and floodwaters, the only option, at least in the lower Marsh Creek area, was to expand, widen the channel, excavate the banks and make room for both flood flows and trees. Oops, sneak peek. Um, so then the question began, well, where do we plant trees along Marsh Creek? And you can see here in this photo that um, uh, a lot, this is taken in the city of Oakley. And um, on the left bank here, a lot of the houses with the fences in the backyard built right up to the creek before the HCP, the 75 foot buffer uh, setback. And then on the right side of the creek, there's still a great opportunity to expand the channel on this, on this site. And American Rivers and the district and the city of Oakley partnered to actually restore this area, five acres of floodplain and riparian habitat in Oakley Creekside Park. And this is what the site looks like today. Much different, yay! <laughs> So the next step is we did an analysis of all the vacant land that was adjacent to Marsh Creek and um, in this very rapidly growing area. And you could see these, this green corridor here became future creek restoration opportunities. And the largest cluster right here is where the Three Creeks Parkway restoration project is located. 
So the Three Creeks project began with a private developer who, uh, on this big green patch here, wanted to build 400 homes on 67 acres. And this was the largest undeveloped stretch of land adjacent to Marsh Creek, so it was a great opportunity. And um, American Rivers staff and consultants um, worked really closely with the Friends of Marsh Creek to work with the developer to get him to um, uh, move his development back away from the creek to make room to widen the channel to plant trees, face homes toward the creek, and also locate all the city parks adjacent to the creek to create more of a natural creek corridor. And we worked really closely with the city of Brentwood, and, um, and then the city of Brentwood included in their conditions of approval um, a requirement that the developer actually go and excavate and restore this as part of his development. And then, as developments do, they moved forward at a lightning fast pace, and as restoration projects do, moved forward very slowly. And, um, and then the developer just ended up donating a million dollars to American Rivers and said, you implement it, we're gonna build our houses, and uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs> but we won't see you. So then, um, so the, the development was right along here, and then Flood Control District had a long-term plan on their books to expand the channel in this middle and upper reach here um, and before the 50-year plan. They, all they wanted to do was expand the channel to make room for more flood waters. It was a little under capacity, but they didn't have a plan to plant trees. So we partnered up, and this whole project became uh, the Three Creeks Project. And, and then American Rivers wrote grants to, to raise money for the trees. So this is the entire Three Creeks Parkway Restoration Project. Uh, it's 4,000 linear feet of creek, and there's five different landowners. And um, the whole project area, did I say this, this 13 and a half acres, but we're gonna restore about five acres of riparian and floodplain habitat. And um, this project, we believe, is the longest urban creek restoration project in Contra Costa County this, this decade. So no restoration project would be possible without numerous partners, and this project is very similar. Um, most project partners I talked about already, but I wanted to uh, shout out to Restoration Design Group who has been involved in the very, since the very beginning, developing conceptual plans for grant proposals all the way up to the 100% uh, civil and landscape designs. And of course, lots of funders. We have eight different funding sources that we've cobbled together for this project. Five state grants, uh, one federal grant from the EPA, uh, one private funder for the developer, and then the Flood Control District is contributing $2 million for, their, um, for the construction as well. And uh, the total funding that we have so far is about $8.5 million. So the project would also not be possible with, uh, without the Friends of Marsh Creek Watershed, the local community group who has been actively engaged since the very beginning, working tirelessly, um, and Supervisor Diane Burgess, who's the former director, executive director of the group, was just great at engaging hundreds of people in um, developing partnership with the developer. And the Friends of Marsh Creek really, they spoke up at planning commissions, city council meetings, park and rec commissions. They took city council members out on tours of the, of the project site and um, talk about watershed warriors, eloquent watershed warriors um, to get this project going. And then we're very happy to announce that construction is going to be is set for this summer, 2020, uh, between June and October. And then planting is going to begin uh, in winter, November 2020, through February 2021, and then continue for the next two years after that. So we'll have a three-year planting cycle. All right, I'll turn it over to Anne.
All right, thanks everyone. I'm going to take you on a little journey over to uh, the western end of the county, West Contra Costa County, and we'll see a little bit how these two restoration projects are very different, as was mentioned in the introduction, but they also have a number of similarities and hopefully things that we can all kind of take and learn from and apply to the other exciting projects happening out there. Um, so I guess just to back up and show everyone where this little restoration project is located, uh, we're looking at the Rolling Wood neighborhood, which is over right next to Contra Costa College. And in fact, the uh, stretch of the creek that I'm gonna be talking about is just upstream of Contra Costa College. I also want to point out how many different jurisdictions overlap in this area. <laughs> so this is, just to give you a little view, this is the creek channel. It's the brief part of the creek, um, and it flows down through the college where the creek is above ground. It's daylighted. Um, not much in the way of habitat, per se, at the moment, although there is a lot of vegetation. We'll get to that. Um, this, the northern side of the creek is City of Richmond territory. The south side of the creek is unincorporated Contra Costa County, that's the Rollingwood neighborhood. Uh, we have the Contra Costa College, which I mentioned already, that's actually state of California land. And over here we have City of San Pablo territory. So it's just a big happy family with a lot of different agencies coming together in this one area. Um, another fun fact about this stretch of the creek is that the northern side of it, again, so the city of Richmond side, once again, is at kind of a higher elevation than the Rolling Wood neighborhood on the south side. And that matters because it floods when it rains on the Rolling Wood side. Um, so these are photos, a couple of them I think taken from uh, Patrick, who's our contact at the city. One of them was uh, sent to me by one of the neighbors who lives in this neighborhood. And um, this neighborhood has just been plagued by this flooding issue for decades at this point. I think anyone in this room who's been involved with this project has heard the stories of how people just have a hard time getting to their cars. They, it really impacts their quality of life in this neighborhood. So that was kind of the motivation behind a restoration project. Um, the issue was there's all these uh, overlapping and unclear jurisdictions. Who's really going to take ownership of this? Whose purview is it? Whose responsibility is it? Um, currently, it's the responsibility of the homeowners to really kind of manage and maintain the creek, and clearly that hasn't been working out so well. So it wasn't until um, Patrick, who's here in the room with us with the city of Richmond, um, he'd been hearing about this from residents for a long, long time and sort of kept pushing and kept championing a restoration project in this neighborhood neighborhood and looked for a way to involve some other project partners because, again, the city couldn't do it by themselves either, so they had to involve some other um, partners here to make this happen. Um, so again, City of Richmond kind of really championed the project. They're still actively involved. Uh, they gathered three other agencies who were the original kind of applicants for the grant for this project. Uh, there's the Watershed Project, uh, who I'm with, and we are the community engagement partner. So our job is to ensure that neighbors have the opportunity to really drive the project, to be involved at every stage, to have their voices heard, and to be involved in what's happening in their creek, in their neighborhood. Uh, Restoration Design Group, who again was mentioned earlier, and Rich is here with us today. Um, they're the design partner for, you know, so hopefully coming up with some solutions to what can be done about this flooding. And of course, American Rivers, who is the project manager, and they were the primary applicant for the grant. So the four of us came together, uh, received a grant, and from there then involved also the rest of the agencies who you know, clearly also have a stake in what's happening here, and it's really important to have this collaborative effort when there are so many different um, agencies involved in the site. So we have uh, Contra Costa College, Contra Costa Public Works, and the City of San Pablo, who've also all been very active and supportive. Uh, being a smaller project at this point and much earlier on in our stage, we have one funding source right now. So we received a grant from the Coastal Conservancy for phase one, or kind of the planning portion of this project. And we're hoping that that plan will then set us up really well to apply for and receive some implementation funding afterward. All right. So community engagement. Um, it was important to us that we involve the neighbors in this uh, 
in this area from the start. So we actually, and we figured that they know what's happening in, in their, around their houses and in their creek best. So we did a neighborhood flood survey. Uh, we went door to door and asked neighbors about how you know, what their experience with the flooding was. We let them know that there was this effort happening. There was a project that is coming down the line in this creek. Um, same as Sarah, we, you know, there were some of them who weren't aware that there was a creek or that, you know, it was supposed to be a creek. Maybe it was more like a ditch. Um, so we let them know about the project. We interviewed them about their experiences with the flooding. So how often does it flood? Um, how high do the waters get? You know, how does water travel through the creek and through the neighborhood? And what kind of impact does that have on the neighbors? Um, and we, it was important to keep that engagement consistent too. So we also uh, set up a neighborhood interest list. We've had several kind of partners, neighbors in this area who've been really interested and invested in this project. It's clearly something that they care very much about, um, who've wanted to stay involved. We also developed a web page that anybody from the neighborhood can go on anytime to kind of check out what's happening with the project. And and then in this picture on the upper right, we also hosted a community work day to help kick off the project. So we were conducting a typographic survey of the creek channel to you know, see a little bit more about how it's actually constructed. Um, and we involved neighbors in helping clear out some of the vegetation just to prepare for the topographic survey. All right, so from here, we've sort of hit the information gathering stage. We have some ideas about what potentially causes this flooding issue. I mentioned before, there's probably there is a lot of vegetation in the creek channel, so that it also causes a lot of sediment buildup. Um, it captures trash and kind of blocks the flow of water even more. It might even just be a question of it being a poorly designed or constructed channel in the first place. Um, so we now have a neighborhood flood survey. Those results that the neighbors shared with us. We also have the topographic survey and our design partner RDG is kind of taking all of that information and coming up with some initial ideas about what we might be able to do in this area. Um, after that, it's our job to then kind of take those ideas back to the neighborhood and ask the neighbors for their feedback on what they wanna see happen in the creek. So as I mentioned before, there are clearly a number of differences between these two projects. Um, the motivation or the objective being the first one. So again, in Ream Creek, it was all about fixing the flooding issue. Um, that was the primary goal of the project. In Three Creeks, uh, they, there wasn't the same kind of flooding issue, but it was more just about habitat restoration, providing shade, providing a better you know, quality of life as well. Um, the surrounding landscape is also a big difference. So in Ream Creek, uh, it's a very densely developed neighborhood. There's no setback between those houses and the creek. Um, the backyards are kind of right up against the creek, so it's it's just right in the middle of this neighborhood. With Three Creeks, um, there was an opportunity there because there were some vacant parcels right adjacent to the creek that provided this opportunity to widen the creek channel and restore habitat there. Uh, the initial engagement strategy was also a little bit different. Again, in Ream Creek, it was very neighborhood-based. We kind of started with that neighborhood flood survey, went knocking on doors, talked to the folks who lived right there. In Three Creeks, it was more about this very dedicated grassroots community group, Friends of Marsh Creek, um, as well as the agencies and the local developers who partnered with the city and the flood control district. So there was a little bit more kind of organized um, community group and agency effort there. Uh, the project stage, clearly. In Ream Creek, we're just getting started. The project kicked off in March of this year, so we're still right at the information gathering stage. Uh, we're hoping to move into design. It's very exciting. Um, in Three Creeks, the project began in 2004, so it's been in the works for a long time. It's really exciting that it's in the approval stage and moving to construction uh, in summer 2020. And then finally, the role of a watershed council versus a watershed group. So in Ream Creek, we've talked a few times today about the Wildcat San Pablo Creek's watershed council, um, and that body has met quarterly for 30 or more years at this point. And that, um, again, we've kind of talked about what it takes to keep that momentum, to keep pushing and advocating. So the council really had a, their consistency was a crucial part in keeping the momentum for that restoration alive. Um, with Three Creeks, they, there 
is no kind of comparable council there. Instead, there was this, again, Friends of Marsh Creek, a small group of very dedicated advocates that instead kept pushing, kept that momentum alive, um, as well as dedicated agency and district staff, of course. Right, yet uh, despite all the differences, there's also a lot of similarities. Uh, both in the Ream Creek and Marsh Creek watersheds, uh, watershed assessments were done in the early 2000s that were very detailed and thorough and identified restoration opportunities along both creeks. Um, in the Marsh Creek report, um, and then also the, the, the corridor opportunity analysis. And then in Ream Creek, it was the Ream Creek watershed assessment and conceptual restoration plan. Um, both projects learned from previous restoration efforts. Um, both watersheds had large scale uh, wetland restoration projects at the mouth of Marsh Creek, Dutch, or the mouth of each creek, Mar Dutch Slough and Marsh Creek, and the, uh, the Bruner Marsh, the Dotson Family Marsh at the mouth of Ream Creek. And then also sm smaller restoration projects, the Oakley Creekside Park I mentioned, and also the Marsh Creek Fish Ladder in Marsh Creek, and then the um, the Contra Costa College restoration project on Ream Creek. So these, um, these projects help provide, uh, prove the concept of restoration in these watersheds and also build local, local capacity for restoration. Um, also, a theme today throughout every restoration project we've heard from is support from local stakeholders and watershed champions. So Friends of Marsh Creek Watershed, American Rivers staff have been involved since the very beginning, and also the district in Marsh Creek. And then on Ream Creek, the city of Richmond being a big project champion, and also the Wild Cat and San Pablo Creek Watershed Council. Um, again, a theme throughout the day, collaboration with multiple jurisdiction, multiple partners. Um, but something that, um, that I think is really important to mention is the, the working across multiple jurisdictions. The creeks flow across land owned by many different landowners, and it's an ecological um, resource that knows no jurisdictional boundaries. So I think it's important, and it's overwhelming and a little scary to take on projects with lots of different landowners when you don't own that piece of property. Um, but I think it makes for a really successful restoration project when you can work across jurisdictions. And then lastly, just restoration as a solution, a solution for flooding problems, a solution for habitat and water quality. And that is it. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, there are a couple questions that were submitted through Slido. Um, oh, let's see. I'm not sure which project this is for, but do you plan to monitor the results of the restoration or work with homeowners on a citizen science monitoring? I'm thinking that's. That's right, Marsh Creek. Free Creeks, yeah. Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, I could talk for days about this project, and so, but the focus of today was how projects get started. But there's a whole nother world of what's going to happen after the project. So we're doing baseline water quality monitoring now, and we have a long, I think we have three years of funding uh, after the project is implemented to do water quality, vegetation, and, and geomorphic monitoring, and hope to involve community citizens scientists, also Earth Team, a major partner that's going to be a, a partner moving forward. They're going to be helping with the planting and also um, engaged uh, Friends of Marsh Creek was going to be helping with planting and future monitoring, both water quality and, um, and hopefully salmon as well. Even though we're not really at that stage yet for Ream Creek, that's definitely part of the discussions as well. We recognize it's an important part of any restoration project, and um, Helen is actually going to be talking next about creek monitoring, so you'll see a little bit of how that works. But we're also hoping to involve neighbors in some sort of monitoring or maintenance plan for that project. All right, one more question. Um, and remember that if you see something on Slidos, you should be checking it as you go through, because there's some good questions on here, and you can rank them to see which ones you're most interested in hearing the answer to. Um, let's see, this one is for maybe both. Does tree planting conflict with Army Corps funding requirements, and if so, how do you handle that? I think that that's probably more Three Creeks. 
because you already have trees there. Well, wait, can you repeat that question? Sure. Is that does, does tree planting can? Oh, Army Corps. Somebody well, fortunately, yeah. I've always been very grateful that the Army Corps is not does not own any of the creek channel in in Marsh Creek, and it's the the Contra Costa County Flood Control owns the Marsh Creek channel. So the Army Corps is not. Um, doesn't have anything to do with, I mean, they permit, uh, they, we have to get a permit from them to do any creek restoration, but but they don't own the channel. So I hope that answered the question. I think so. All right, thank you both very much for your compare contrast of Green Creek and Bree Creek. All right, we're gonna keep moving forward. We have our award for the Outstanding Watershed Project and also our Notable Projects. And then we have another keynote presentation. This one will be from Evan Schwartz with the California Coastal Commission. All right, so first, our Watershed, our Outstanding Watershed Project. We had a number of nominations and the one that actually takes the award home is one that's close to my heart at least and I wasn't the only person voting, by the way. Um, it is the Pinole Creek um, fish Passage Restoration Project. And it was, it was organized and coordinated by the Contra Costa Resource Conservation District over a number of years. And so we're going to have Igor Skardoff, our board president, and Carol Arner Arnold, who was um, our executive director at the Resource Conservation District at the time, come to receive the reward, award. But Igor wants to say a couple of words. Couple. I've been threatened with bodily harm if I talk too long, so I won't. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say that Carol is the godmother of this project. She worked on this thing for 10 years or more, rounding up support, rounding up money, organizing everybody to get together to do this thing, and it got done. And so thank you, Carol. <laughs> I. I'd like to thank Bert Mulcahy, who can't be here today, but it was his uh, concept. He's a fisheries biologist for East Bay Mud and has lived the, his whole life in the Pinole Creek watershed. And uh, thank the RCD Board of Directors for being so brave to allow us to do this. <laughs> All right, thank you both. And also, again, with the story of collaboration toward your project partners that you got to pull in, uh, the Flood Control District and Caltrans. I think there were two of the part the big partners that you had to work with. Wildlife. Fish and Wildlife and the City of Pinole, and it's all about collaboration when it comes to watershed work. Thank you very much. And we had a couple of notable projects that, again, they over the last four years, they just made watershed history here in Contra Costa County. We had um, the Morhen Marsh Restoration Project, which was recently completed along 680. It's part of the Mountain View Sanitary District lands. And I'm not sure if Kelly is here yet, but I will give this award to her later on. And one that I forgot to mention when um, Director Dotson was here from East Bay Parks is the Dotson Family Marsh. And that restoration project there is also listed as one of our notable projects for this symposium. And now we're going back to Brendan. Thank you. Thanks to our award winners. And keep in mind, and, and thank you everybody for doing um, God's work with the slide app and all the questions that have been coming in. So when you're listening to the next presentation, keep them coming and we'll get to as many as we can. Now we're going to hear from Helen Fatanides. And I hope I said that right, Helen. Um, Helen has been involved with watersheds for a number of years now and currently manages the Watershed Project. Her programs teach the importance of water quality testing, are a familiar part of the Watershed Forum's regular meetings, and she's going to talk to us about why testing is very important and how the Watershed Project is standardizing it with the county. Helen, welcome. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? So today, I'll be talking about the current water quality monitoring programs 
at the Watershed Project and also a couple of upcoming new programs for this next year. And also, lastly, a new way that you can get involved and explore our data. So we have a monthly monitoring program where we look at uh, kind of the big five, the vital signs of a creek. That would be temperature, specific conductivity, dissolved oxygen, pH, turbidity. And then this last year, we've actually also been able to look at nitrates, which has been really exciting. We use um, YSI multimeter sons that are uh, very precise and a little bit tricky to deal with and a little bit expensive, but they're great. And we have trained monitoring technicians that take these out in the field, and then we also involve the community, students, anyone who wants to come with us as well. So these are the sites where we monitor monthly. You can see there's kind of, there's a range of sites here. Um, starting in West County, we have San Pablo, Ream, and Wildcat Creeks. Central County is um, Alhambra, uh, Grayson, and Walnut, and then Marsh Creek over in East County. And when I first moved to this area about five or six years ago, my first job was actually monitoring water quality in Lower San Pablo Creek, working with spawners. And they actually had data going back as far as about 2009, 2010, which is really exciting to see data going on for that long, that kind of baseline monitoring level. But the issue is that we were using meters that couldn't really be calibrated, and we were using methods that couldn't really be compared to what other groups were doing around the county. And the more I met people at places like this, at the Watershed Forum, the more I talked to groups, it seemed like there was a similar trend. And what I really wanted to do was to standardize things so that we could still do that community-level monitoring, um, but we could make our data we, we could use our data. We could have other people actually use our data. So we do calibration before we go out each monitoring day. And then we also check accuracy after the event. And this data sheet was put together with the help of Revital Katz Nelson, who used to be with SWAMP, the Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program. And she was with the Clean Water Team. And this is a really important part um, to prove that your data is is good and accurate. This is our monthly monitoring data sheet. It's a little bit involved. There's a lot of information up top. In the middle, there's an observational section. And this can be done without any equipment at all. It can be done by someone who lives on the creek and sees something weird. And then that data can be actually compared to the data we take every month at these sites. And then you can see, as well, in the measurement section, we have two columns for our results. So we actually get a couple of readings per parameter at each site. And this allows us to look at um, data precision in the field and actually know that our, that our meter isn't wandering or doing anything weird. So we also do some seasonal monitoring. One of those is stormwater monitoring. So this tends to be the first flush, the first rain of the water year, or we, we go out during other storms too. Um, and it kind of depends, uh, what we do depends on our level of funding. So sometimes it's just dip strips that we give to volunteers around the county. Sometimes we work with Contra Costa College or other groups to do uh, some testing in their labs. And then if we have enough funding, we send it off to the, the big expensive labs. This is our data from fall 2018. This is using an app called Water Reporter. This is cool because it involves volunteers. You can, they can post their photos and information using this app to our website. And so this is looking at a parameter nitrate. On the bottom is the list of parameters that those dip strips tested for. And things are color coded based on whether they pass the healthy threshold or not. So it's a really cool informational way to, for volunteers to see their data being used. We also monitor bioswales. So this is a bioswale at the Booker T. Anderson Community Center in Richmond. And you can see those curb cuts letting water in from the parking lot into the bioswale. You can see uh, the outflow under that grate. 
So those PVC pipes run the length of the swale. They're perforated and they collect the water after it's filtered through vegetation, layers of soil, gravel, et cetera, hopefully cleaner than it went in. And actually, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but um, there's a short video, but you can kind of see what's happening here. Um, this is the outflow that we saw earlier, and this was uh, last, last week, Tuesday, the first flush for, for this water year. Massive amounts of rain, a huge amount of overflow. Um, it was pretty exciting to be out there during that, but we were still able to collect samples. We collect samples from the inflow and compare them to samples from the outflow to see if uh, it's working. So this is some of our data from 2018. You can see on the bottom of the graphs is the parameter that we were looking at, and then the bar of, for the inflow is a little darker blue than the bar for the outflow. And looking at diesel and motor oil and metals in particular, we see at least 50% reduction from the inflow to the outflow. So that was pretty exciting. This is just one data point, and we'll continue to monitor. It'll be interesting to see how this looks over time. And then, um, depending on funding, we also look at uh, pesticides, PCBs, pyrethroids, and uh, other things like that that tend to be more expensive. This is our stormwater monitoring crew at a training recently. And you can see on the photo on the right, uh, one of our former staff members, Nikki, is really excited to see all the dirty water entering the swale. So this is my favorite thing to do in creeks, um, is look for bugs. So benthic means bottom dwelling. Macro means you can see them with your naked eye. And invertebrates means they don't have a backbone. And a lot of the insects that you see flying around creeks uh, probably spend a good chunk of their life actually in the creek in their larval or nymph stages. And each group has a different level of tolerance to pollution. So you can kind of get an, a macro scale of how healthy the creek is based on what bugs you find in it. So this guy over here has a very high tolerance to pollution. That's a damselfly nymph. Um, and then this, oops, this mayfly over here has a much lower tolerance. So lower tolerance means it needs pretty clean water. Um, and we do this either as an educational activity, just with kids in the creek, identifying down to family, or we also do a full uh, fish and wildlife protocol, the full reach, a ton of samples, send them off to a lab, get data down to genus and species, and then we can get, a, get an actual creek score. These are a couple of graphs that compare our data that we collected in 2018 to some data that I got online off of Seeden, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, basically, there's a couple of things you can look at when you're looking at benthic macroinvertebrates. One is tolerance, as I mentioned. So it's good to have intolerant species in your creek. It means the water has got to be somewhat clean or somewhat low pollution. And you can see there's a difference between 2007 and 2018. Now, who's been to Davis Park in San Pablo? Some people must be, yeah. So there's a big restoration project that happened between 2007 and 2018. Um, restored a big chunk of creek, and it looks to me like it's working to some extent. Um, the other thing you can look at is taxonomic richness, so just, um, just how many species you find, and that improved drastically as well. We have a couple of new programs that we'll be starting probably next year. Uh, one is for fecal coliforms. So these are for many warm-blooded mammals. It could be humans or dogs or anything, really. Um, we got some new equipment, and so we can actually test these for ourselves now. And we'll be interested in looking at swimming holes and creeks. We're also interested in looking at um, up and downstream of homeless encampments. There's a lot of talk, and I haven't seen that much data, and I'm really interested in collecting some of that. So if you have any ideas for sites where we could do this, let me know. We also are going to be starting to look at algae a little bit more um, using the Water Reporter app, so the people can upload their photos of algae or things like that. And I should say, a lot of the funding for all of our programs comes from the county in one way or another. It's either 
a watershed program or a flood control or uh, the Fish and Wildlife Committee. So they've been really integral supporters for this project. Oh, and then we also try to prevent New Zealand mud snails from spreading any farther. These are very small snails that are very good at surviving and reproducing and traveling. Um, so we always decontaminate, warn people about them. And uh, yeah, they're, they're getting around. So our data collection methods are designed to fit into SEDEN. So that's the California Environmental Data Exchange Network. And this is a place where it can be used by regulators and professionals. It is a small feat to get data into SEDEN. There's a lot of codes and a lot of very specific language that you need to use. Um, and it was a goal of mine with this program starting was to get our data into SEDEN. Um, and I think as important as it is to make sure our data is useful to regulators and professionals, I believe it's also important to make it understandable to the public. And that is why we have put together an interactive and educational site where people can explore our data as well as the data of other people and learn about Creek Health. Um, this was done as of this week. <laughs> Our partners uh, were Flow West and their nonprofit arm, which is Intelligent Ecosystems Institute. And we got funding from California EPA and from the Rose Foundation. And I'm going to take you on a little walkthrough, but the uh, website is down here. It is live now if you're interested in checking it out. I did not want to anger the technology gods by uh, trying to do a live demo. So these are screenshots. So the main page has a little bit of welcome about our project. It has some little buttons where you can learn about water quality features. If you click on one of those, you get a little uh, pop-up screen. For instance, it'll tell you about nutrients and how high nutrients can cause dead zones. It'll tell you about the differences between the different kinds of nutrients. And then if we scroll down, there's a map that shows all of the sites that the Watershed Project collects data, as well as sites that we pulled from Seeden, where there's a lot of data being collected by other people. On the left, there's a list of creeks. You can either click on a watershed or click on a creek on that list. I'm going to click on San Pablo Creek. And here we see a picture, a description of the creek, which comes from the Watershed Atlas. Thank you very much. Um, we also have a creek report card where you can see how all the parameters are doing. You can see for specific conductivity it's not doing so great and if I were to hover over that it would tell you um, a little bit about conductivity and why it might not be doing so well in an urban creek. If we, so you can explore sampling sites. I'm going to I'm going to choose the site that's farthest downstream. It is at the El Sobrante Library over here. If I click on that, um, you can see uh, a little bit of information about that site in particular. Um, and then we can select different water quality features or parameters. In this case, temperature is selected. And what's really cool and what I had not been able to do in different apps in the past is to look at this site versus other sites in the watershed. And so down here, you can click on which sites. So those are all the sites we monitor in the San Pablo Creek watershed. And if I add a couple of tributaries to this, you can see, uh, let's see, the blue line is a library. Appian Creek is a tributary that's right, uh, comes into the main stem right above the library. You can see those are pretty close together in terms of temperature. Louder Wasser Creek, however, is much farther upstream, and you can see it has a much lower temperature, which makes sense. It's closer to the headwaters. It probably has a lot of shade. It's a pretty healthy creek. And then if I go here, and for more details, I'll get information on the parameter I'm looking at, the threshold that we think is healthy, and where that threshold comes from. And then there's also, up top, there's an Images tab. So you can click on that and see images that we take while we're monitoring. 
This is just a little more detail. Um, another kind of graph we have on here is, so this is back at the Bioswale in Richmond at Booker T. Anderson. Um, this is looking at copper. So you can see in 2018, we checked the inflow levels before there was a Bioswale built. And then in 2019, we actually looked at before and after, inflow versus outflow. And you can see copper is being reduced to a level that's actually below threshold, which is exciting. And then we also have data from other people. And this is pulled off of Seeden, the database. And this um, has been going on much longer. So you'll often see a lot of data over the years. And there's a click and drag component. So if you want to take a closer look at any of that, you can just basically select it. And it'll zoom in. And you can see more information. There's an about page that talks about what we do and how our methods contact for information, and then, importantly, how we're calculating those feature scores for the general parameters and for the benthic macroinvertebrates. So in summary, I believe it is possible to collect good um, defensible data while involving and educating the community about their local creeks and watersheds. And I think this is a common theme today that it's so important to involve the community, perhaps especially youth. And we work in particular with um, Contra Costa College and Diablo Valley College, uh, Salesian High, and other schools in the area. And I am consistently impressed by the interest of these students and how they want to get involved in making a difference in their natural areas that they're surrounded by. And they just need a chance. Thanks, and I'll take questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saving your voice for us today. Oh, there were two questions. Where did they go? Oh, I have them. Okay, the first question is, algae is not bad per se. Oh, it, can be, it can be an important habitat. How will you evaluate that? So I had some interesting conversations with Mary Power at UC Berkeley. Um, she told me some preliminary ways that we can get an idea of whether the algae is good or bad. And then um, once we get some data, I'm going to be working with her students to do that. So yeah, we want to know where the algae is so we can go out, take a look, and, uh, and figure out if it's good or bad. Because yeah, algae is a good thing. Nutrients are a good thing. It's just all in moderation or at some level. Thank you. Uh, and the other question I have, or the audience has, from Joe. Uh, and this goes to what you were saying at the end of your talk, is do you have trouble finding volunteers? Yes and no. Um, I think it's really easy to find interested youth, and it's a little bit harder to get them out to the areas that we are, we are working in. And at the times that we're working in them, a lot of times we have so many sites now, we can't just do it on weekends. Um, and so a lot of times we are going out during school hours. And these sites are not super accessible, so there's a lot of carpooling, ride sharing. Uh, public transit isn't super helpful. Um, yeah. There's, there's a lot of interest, and it's just a matter of finding the right times for people, I think. And if somebody knows anybody who might be curious about volunteering, they can contact you at the Watershed Project. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. Helen, great work.